This is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the automotive industry is complexity reduction at the manufacturing plant. So I'm going to tell you a story about when I supported an, a, an American OEM. We were paid hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of many months studying wire harness complexity at a plant that manufactured a small SUV that had millions of different combinations of vehicles that could be built. And the reason why it's millions is because I think they had 10 or 12 colors of vehicle. And then there was seven or eight trims. Like, so I'm going to give an example. There's L LS, LT, L LTX, you know, all these different trims, yeah. limited. Um, they had special versions. And every time you introduce a special version into the model mix, it creates a synchronization nightmare for line side kitting. Um, because you're building a special high performance version. Maybe you have a V6 and an off road package on one, and the next is an inline four in the off road package, and the next one has air suspension and the inline. Like it, so when it comes to variation and complexity, there are some OEMs that have always been really good. One of them that's been really good in the past is Honda in their Marysville plant. They're, they were known for building like silver Honda Civics for one whole day. And it was only one trim level. and But they still had several trim le levels. They had leather seats. They had cloth seats. They had the manual transmission. They had the automatic transmission. They may have a low-end four-cylinder and then the high-end four-cylinder. So they batch and, them and basically push that batch through that yeah, day. There, there's some batching. And then the variation of colors were, were limited to you know five or six colors versus other mm. OEMs would offer 12 colors. So what I'm getting at is think about how simple a Tesla is and what they give away. So everybody who orders a Model 3 or a Model Y and does not activate the FSD, uh, doesn't pay the 15 grand for FSD, Tesla is choosing to give away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars of silicon chips that are not utilized for all of that processing capability. They're also giving away the sensor suite because there's a tremendous value in that data that's being collected and being sent back to the dojo chip to being processed to build up their uh, their the learning for their FSD system. And so imagine a purchasing agent at a traditional OEM with the opportunity to save $300 or $500 per car by introducing a lower cost hardware for the people who choose not to buy the, the FSD option. Mm. That is what has been the standard practice for decades at OEMs. Uh, purchasing uh, personnel would be promoted if they saved $4 per car by changing the wire harness complex, changing the wire harness, decontenting connectors and wires. There's a tremendous savings there. Um, but when Sandy and I visited the uh, Texas factory, one thing was very clear. Tesla has world-class leading low-level complexity. Um, whether you get a long-range battery or a short-range battery, um, it bolts up to the vehicle the same. They don't change the case for that. Um, when you're getting a white interior or a black interior, there's very limited changes. You, you don't have white, black, cloth. You don't have special leather from, you know, the Corinthian leather that that's a joke from the, from the seventies <laughs> or eighties. You ever hear about that? The yeah. 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 <laughs> the Corinthian leather. yeah. So, and then if you look at technology read across, imagine a traditional OEM in the nineties that used the exact same engine for their small car, their midsize car, their large car, their midsize SUV and their trucks. So, I, I use the word engine because think about the powertrain configurations for Tesla. If you buy a Model 3 or a Model Y, the rear motor is an internal permanent magnet motor with a silicon carbide uh, chipped inverter. That inverter has the ability to replace it with silicon, uh, silicon discrete chips to be used in the front, but the form factor and the shape is the same. 
And then the front motor is an induction version of the same motor with an identical gearbox. So the gearbox is common front and rear. Now you take it out of the Model 3, you put the same thing in the Model Y. That's easy to understand. They're similar size vehicles. But now you talk about the Plaid. We tore the Plaid down. That dual motor set up in the rear, we pulled the inverters out. It said Model 3 right on the side. They're Model 3 inverters. And the motors, uh, they do wrap them in carbon fiber and they change the rotor. But the core architecture of the powertrain remains the same. That same read across will then per- will most likely be prop- propagated to the Cybertruck because when they revealed what the Cybertruck powertrain configuration looks like, it's essentially kind of a version of the plaid for the dual motor dual motor unit, and the tri motor would have a uh, essentially a single motor in the front, which would be either induction or internal permanent magnet. Yeah, that level of commonality and read across gets you the scale across your organization to lower costs. And then when you get scale, there is a little bit of a risk. If you have a quality issue with or a design flaw, it could wipe out your whole fleet. Imagine if there's a recall on the transfer shaft in the Mm. gearbox of every Tesla made. It would affect all of them. uh, All Model S plaids, all Model S's, all Model X's, all Model Y's, all Model 3's. So in order to achieve this level of commonality across the entire portfolio of vehicles, you have to have tremendous faith that your powertrain and the elements that are on all vehicles are incredibly reliable. And with EVs, you get that reliability Um, because from a thermodynamic perspective, you're not introducing 60 to 80 percent of your energy as waste heat and vibration which is the main cause of of wear tear and maintenance it's the heat and vibration that like an internal Mm -hmm. combustion engine has to reject and the friction Mm -hmm. associated with that so it's amazing the paradigm shift that we're seeing in how technology and components are deployed across a portfolio of vehicles Yet other OEMs are still operating like they used to, where each vehicle is getting a bespoke sized gearbox and motor. It's like, why can't you develop one um, option for all your vehicles? And even GM, they they talk about their Ultium platform. I forget how many configurations. It's like 14 different configurations of gearboxes, motors, and and inverters. So... I know it's kind of a long-winded explanation, but I think complexity reduction and technology read read across. Um, And the one last thing is the thermal system. So when the Model Y came out with the super, with the octo valve and the super manifold, um, they made it backwards compatible to replace the Model 3, fit in the same spot where the super bottle was. And then when we bought our Model S Plaid and tore it down, all of the core critical components, the super manifold, the plate heat exchangers, the, the solenoids, um, the octo valve, the way everything's connected and routed through the vehicle, common, Model 3, Model Y. And then when the Cybertruck comes out, I would bet a box of donuts with Sean Mitchell that <laughs> it will be the same core components on that thermal system on the Cybertruck. But the Cybertruck's much larger. So they had enough forethought to most likely design in the capability to handle the thermal loads of not only the Plaid, which they did, but also the Cybertruck. Gotcha. So, so much valuable uh, insight there. This this is sort of how I'm processing it in my brain. And you tell me if, if it's fair to, to frame it in this respect. So um, it sounds like this lack of complexity or the dramatic reduction in complexity, which Tesla... Uh, almost pride, prides itself on uh, when building their cars appears to be really the key differentiator or one of the key differentiators as to why, uh, in theory, they're able to reduce the prices as much as they have, yet retain a healthy level of profitability. And, and one of the reasons why 
you see this sort of dynamic is because it appears like in at least some or most of legacy automakers or traditional automakers, you're rewarded <laughs> for introducing complexity to try and reduce costs. So mm-hmm. where some you get a bonus or a raise or a promoted if you're able to, like you said, to remove four dollars off the car's cost by introducing a new process. But what this what this does over time is introduce complexity into your manufacturing process, which uh, it might be a hidden cost that's tough to calculate unless you're in a position where a competitor introduces a new paradigm shift of being able to produce the car as simply as humanly possible. Uh, and I think the thing that the equation that probably broke that, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, is that legacy automakers and traditional auto are banking on the fact that the traditional car consumer loves optionality. But with with a new with a with this electric car paradigm, as long as you're offering something that ticks most boxes, it appears that people don't really mind uh, not being able to get you know this freaking chrome trim on the left side of your car or whatever these little minutia in the, in the process, and and that's ultimately what's giving the last ten years of what Tesla has been working on is like it almost feels like this price change last week has been the culmination of all those efforts, especially putting it in, in comparison to everybody else. Um, is that, is that a fair way of, of s- sort of like uh, visualizing this from this perspective? Is there anything I missed there? Or would you say it's accurate? No, no, that's spot on. Yeah. And oftentimes I get painted as like a Tesla apologist, like, Oh, you're just so pro Tesla. I let the data speak. So, Many people will be interviewed and they, they speak through secondhand data or like this report I read or, or this study I saw. I, you know, our team, myself personally, have seen hundreds of cars. I've been in meetings that are so boring, it would make most people cry about how <laughs> the rear shock is mounted on a minivan. The Sounds direction. like a great time, Corey. <laughs> and so why that matters is I once fought for three or four months to have the rear shock of a minivan, minivan be screwed in from the side. But because a plant had vestigial tooling that screwed from the bottom, they were driving about three and a half dollars and three pounds into each vehicle to have these aluminum cups uh, at the top of the shock with holes and bolts and uh, because they didn't want to add an additional station after that. So I fought and I fought and I built a business case. So, and it eventually turned out that that minivan now has the shock screwed in from the side huh. and I sleep better at night because I know that that vehicle is about $7 less to produce, but it's amazing how many tiny decisions like that add up to the total cost of a vehicle. Mm 